next presentation is by the Royal Rocketeers team on the um, on the M1 Russian moon rocket research. Okay. Hi, I'm Matt Johnson. I'm Smash and Mark from Michigan. I'm Muskegon. And uh, it's my pleasure to be up here representing the Royal Rocketeers, uh, myself, Pam Gilmore, and Jake Helbert cool. in our club. Uh, basically, uh, my project was basic research and development at its heart, I think, is to actually discover information that has been unknown to date for so long. So, next uh, slide, please. Okay. Uh, my goal is to research the N1 moon rocket and discover uh, measurements in metric and uh, the launch complex from the from the uh, circa 1969 launch period, uh, and uh, had that information scaled for modeling, which is what my goal was at the time for 952. Next, please. Okay, uh, when that, when I began the project, my initial contact was made with. Uh, uh, Mike Dorfler at the time in Estes, and he was the American contact for Alex Lipinski, who was the gentleman that made the hand-drawn blueprints at the time uh, that it was available. So I actually got those first. I made a small eight or ten inch uh, N1 model, and after I decided that I wanted to make a larger one, I found out you could order the AutoCAD. But to do that, you had to go through Mike, and you had to document that you were being an official contest person or for some kind of research. And then for 100 bucks, you can get the AutoCAD, which was uh, designed by uh, Alex Schleitinski from St. Petersburg. Uh, this led to a great relationship with Mike over the years that we worked on it, and uh, also Alex. And then I got a phone call out of the blue from uh, Nick Stevens in England, who was a great CGI artist in uh, London. And he said, hey, I'm friends with Alex, and I also worked with Mike, and we want to do the other one work with you. And uh, we had some enthusiasts working that way, and I found out that a friend of Nick's was also uh, Igor Raisa, and he had worked on the Barak project. And so he was intimately involved with Mike and And then we had uh, Vladimir, who was another gentleman who was able to bring children to the Mike and complex and actually measure the debris field using children as an excuse to get on the site. And then after that, uh, Alex, that's where Alex got some of his measurements from too. So they uh, worked together in that sense. And uh, then I had Peter, who was also an excellent modeler and a translator for us. And uh, uh, we went on and continued from that project. Uh, at that point, I had done my Naran 52 uh, project, which was the four foot version, which is now currently on a scale contest again. That next one takes Chris. So, to produce that four foot model, my project was to literally take Alex's AutoCAD and uh, go through and measure everything to the millimeter, which had not been, I mean, he had done it to make his AutoCAD, but there was not an extant uh, version of this material that was related, drawn by drawing point by point to the model. So I had to go through and measure the whole thing from my data bank for the 952 project. And, uh, that's uh, also when I started working on a launch complex to match it up. Next one, please, Chris. So, uh, during the production of the, of the data pack and the project for NAR52, uh, we got done. I had this big, fat, thick data pack, which I now know uh, from years of experience, you don't need for your uh, for your scale project judging. But I said, this has got to be worth something. And they said, you're a stupid person, this is all R&D stuff. So uh, I said, well, one of the best places to put this is, is in the book. So it was a paying forward opportunity that I relished, and it was also an ability to get some of this information that we had gathered that uh, had never been uh, released before. And um, one of the things about that is the Russians, I don't know if any of ever worked with any of them, but at this time especially, they're very reticent to let their secrets out or let their, let their guard down. They don't smile very often, and they don't trust people very often. So it was very rewarding to know that uh, they trusted us enough to let us have some stuff that was never released, photographs and drugs. So uh, I worked with Jack, and uh, we got our book together. So uh, ARA Press produced this, the book after three years of research, and uh, thanks for pleasure. The accurate measurements were the key. I wanted to make it a scale uh, information, a 
available. I don't make an AD6.1 scale version when I did my forfeit version. And uh, corrections were made from this information to longstanding myths and, and misconceptions about the model. Thanks, for Chris. Uh, some of these things were the fact that the model, the actual rocket is gray. Uh, over the years, the bad photography, uh, fluorescent lighting, and general east-west miscommunications had believed the rocket was green. That was a lot of Russian rockets, that's the case. We had uh, color variations from uh, the six different, or the five different versions that were flown. <clears throat> Every picture that was available had uh, red objects on the hull, and people didn't know if those were part of the flying uh, configuration or not. Same thing goes with the uh, those pipe organs that were on there, the, the three big pipes that were hanging off all the time. Uh, those even showed up in the Smithsonian Institute. And uh, uh, antenna designs, fuel line covers, everything that we could work on that was the confusion over the years was clarified. Next one, please, Chris. So, uh, as I said, the Smithsonian Institute had the pipe organs, including the lunar module, excuse me, lunar models uh, model also had the pipe organs on. Next one, Chris. And uh, so, the conclusion that is my result of all this is that yes, uh, as a humble modeler, over uh, the years of uh, communication with other uh, persons involved in projects, it is possible to do research on things that are hidden and discovered. And uh, working with my friends in Russia and England, uh, we managed to produce a uh, book of reference material, such as this one here, from ARA Press. Uh, next one, please, please. So Alex is keen to work on another book with uh, other Russian rockets at this time. So we'll see what happens. Next one, please. Is there another one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a book. Next one. So in the book uh, project, we had uh, photographs of uh, launches, the first four. Next one, please. Just go through these. Uh, documenting the various uh, failures that occur. And the Russians, of course, developed by experience. They work on the launch and find out what happened. Launch and find out what happened. They don't have the access, or they didn't have the access to development and research, as we may have done with Saturn V, they actually just going to fly it, see what went wrong, and then fix it. Next one. Over on the left, we see uh, photographs of the material that was used after the destruction for making the sequels and part materials and stuff for kids. Next one, please. The one on the left here is part of the most famous photograph of the 70 engines that were hidden by the Russians uh, in the 60s uh, after the project was shut down. These were discovered and now were used to fly uh, Satellites out of Cape Canaveral. Left hand side is, excuse me, the right hand side is uh, various configurations. Here again, explaining the various, uh, various materials, the red objects that were uh, fuel covers and uh, dust covers, uh, engine placement, where the uh, first one that was flown had a different set of engines that were actually quantified for that stage, mostly because it was a model that didn't have the uh, lunar aspect uh, in Attached to it. Next one, please. Okay. okay uh, a more uh, confusion on the body parts that were clarified with uh, Alex's drawings. Next one, please. And uh, stringers were used to uh, support the object, the, the uh, staging after it was uh, sitting on the uh, uh, launch pad. It has a weight scale model. They found cracks in the, object, in the uh, side of the uh, launch system, and so they put more stringers on. This is the weight model here. Next one, please. There's some of our friends uh, on the various debris field objects. Next one. More uh, artifacts being measured and documented. This is the debris field that spread out all through the desert of Baikonur. Next, please. Some rare color photographs. This, this is where I get the stuff that was never shown before. Rare color photographs, especially of the school children, uh, helping to measure the objects. Next, please. More kids. This is the impact crater from uh, one particular failure. Next, please. This is what I did. It took me two years. I went through every single uh, stage and measured what I thought were relevant points for modeling. Next, please. First stage, next. The bottom of the first stage, next. This is the uh, control points uh, for uh, resting the rocket on the launch pad. Next, please. Antennas that uh, were always in contention. Next, please. And the infamous grid fins, which are actually supersonic grid fins, Turns out the Russians are pretty popular with this and the inventors of it. Uh, basically, when you go uh, past supersonic, they work great. When you're below supersonic, they cause the disturbance and drag, but they're excellent for going fast. Next, please. 
Second stage, next please. Second stage rotation, these are all four, four turns to the object. Next please. Top and bottom, next please. And, I'm sorry, that was second stage. Third stage now, next please. And again. So I measured all these various objects that we'd always wonder where they were, measured the, the, the entrance hatches, control points. Okay, here we go. They were folded for transport, and they were exposed the entire time to watch. Serious white they come on by? Well, uh, they, they, I always, my mind would help that it's as it was, but watched. But they were folded up for the transportation, that's where the other was. Did anyone ever get super uh, Yeah, actually, the, uh, the third launch was 106 seconds, I believe, so that uh, had plenty of time to get that fast. They, they, they actually, uh, the first time they had flown, they got past the first stage, they actually decided to fire the second stage manually because they knew that the bottom one was lost after the engines had failed. So I just have a question. Sure. You, you built one of these for NARAM-52. Yes. And then you entered that in like a scale competition? Yes. You didn't enter it in any R&D or anything? No, uh, that was before this was completed. Because uh, it had been in the state of the uh, data pack at that time. So it was from the data pack for, two, for a year or two after that that I did this serious research on making the book uh, layout for a book. And this is my layout for the book. Jack's, if you notice the book is slightly different. Uh, a lot of the CGI stuff was entered into the book later uh, after Nick said he could do it. What was the most surprising thing you found about the book? The uh, most surprising thing, I think, was the uh, uh, LK drive, the, the, the lunar section. The, 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 the rocket had been designed for a Mars project. Everything from that was white from the four stage up was lunar. And so it was basically a heavy lift rocket. And then the LK area, which is the lunar lander, and the uh, L3, the, uh, the lock, uh, uh, the detail and information on that that I had never known, except for some very, very brief mentions on the, uh, NOVA. I, I discovered a lot about that. Questions from the audience? Yes. Sir. What kind of feedback did you go get from Russia? Now well, uh, we've, all we've really have heard is uh, emails back from uh, Alex and Igor and Vladimir who are very, very happy. I think they want a Russian version, but aside from that, uh, Jack has sold, I know it's not really Russian, but it's Europe, but Jack sold 50 copies to Germany almost the first day. I think they probably used it in a college class or something. But uh, we're selling a lot of multiple copies to Europe. And uh, as far as the Russians go, uh, this is as hidden from them as it was from everybody else. As you, if you read the book, you find the, the history from uh, Alex, where he talks about skulking down the quarters, quarters of his college, uh, you know, being afraid to talk to somebody about the rocket he's discovered. And then they hand him a piece of paper and say, hey, here's a drawing I had. And it, it was a cloak and dagger until 92. So it's, it's, uh, I think they're very happy to have it. As a history for their own. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, John. So There's probably 60 pages at the end of my documentation for the judges that are literally uh, measurements of every single piece that I measured to show that it was done, the documentation that it was done. Uh, the raw data beyond that is uh, some photographs which you can't publish because of various legal reasons. But for the most part, everything that made the book as a research project is, is on disk and available uh, from the RA Press. So it's basically one CD of uh, photographs and, of course, the drawings put my red lines all over them and stuff like that. So. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.